Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our Family Planning and Cancer Program being hosted by National Council of Jewish Women. My name is Irene Papernick and I'm co-chair of L'Chaim Cancer Support for Jewish Women. We at National Council are a volunteer-based organization dedicated to education and social action. One of our signature programs is the L'Chaim Cancer Support Program. Partnering with Wellspring, L'Chaim offers peer and caregiver support in a caring, confidential manner. Educational and social programming is also offered to comfort and support Jewish women from diagnosis through treatment. A major focus of our work is to reach and engage younger women through our important work. The genesis of this program was to identify a topic that would resonate with younger women, focusing upon family planning in the face of cancer. We had a wonderful committee of women, including two younger women who face cancer at an early age. Thank you to Lauren Newman and Liat Gerlich for your guidance in putting this program together. We are fortunate to have a preeminent panel of experts tonight to provide you with important insights. This program will be followed up in two weeks with a panel focused upon surrogacy, adoption, spiritual and mental well-being. Thank you to all of our panelists for lending their time and expertise. Thank you also to Trio Fertility for sponsorship of this evening's program and to Dr. Ariel Cantor for her time and input into shaping this program. Unfortunately, due to a serious illness in her family, she is unable to attend the program. However, her content and perspective will be presented by Dr. Greenblatt. We, want, we hope you will join us. And if you feel comfortable going and being on video, please do so. If you prefer to just listen, please do that, whatever your comfort level is. And now my co-chair, Susan Austin, will introduce our guest speakers. There will be an opportunity at the end of the presentations for questions. Susan. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, I am going to introduce uh, the speakers and give you a short, a short bio. So first of all, let me introduce Dr. Kelsey Mills, who is going to be your moderator. Dr. Dr. Mills is an OBGYN in Victoria, BC, and has a menopause subspecialty practice. She is a board member of the Canadian Menopause Society and Menopause Foundation of Canada. Her grandmother, Bonnie Gerby Overshalom, was president of NCJWC and NCJW Winnipeg section. Bonnie was also a North American chair and life member of ICJW. Her aunt, Brenly, uh, Brenly Gerby and cousin, Sharon Allen Tuck, are also past presidents of National Council. Dr. Mills is thrilled to moderate this NCJW Toronto section event as a contribution to an organization that has meant so much to her family. Next, I will admit she will introduce um, Dr. Ellen Greenblatt. So Dr. Greenblatt is a pioneer in reproductive health. She is the former Reproductive Sciences Division Head, Department of, Obst of Obstetrics and Gynecology, at the Sinai Health System, as well as the former medical director of the Mount Sinai Fertility Center. Dr. Greenblatt's philosophy is deeply rooted in empathy and understanding. As she says, I'm inspired by my patient's commitment to start a family. It's honest and pure, making me invest wholeheartedly to help them achieve their goals. Dr. Greenblatt's clinical passion has led, led her to create one of the first programs in Canada in fertility preservation for women diagnosed with cancer, whose treatment puts them at risk of future infertility or sterilization. That program was called Onco Fertility and it was launched in 2003. Finally, I will introduce, or we will introduce Dr. Warner, Ellen Warner. Dr. Warner is a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto and a staff medical oncologist at the Odec Cancer Centre in Sunnybrook since 1993. Her practice and research are devoted to breast cancer. 
Dr. Warner is the creator and director of PYNK, Breast Cancer Program for Young Women. Launched in 2008, it is the only interdisciplinary clinical and research program in Canada for breast cancer patients diagnosed at age 40 or younger. Thank you very much. And I'd now like to hand over to Kelly, please. Thank you, Susan, for the introductions and thank you for the invitation to moderate today. Uh, I think this should be a really amazing opportunity to hear from two people that were preeminent enough to be my teachers when I was in Toronto. Uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Warner remembers, uh, Dr. Greenblatt tells me she does, but I think we can learn a lot from these incredible women physician leaders uh, who have expertise in these areas of fertility, breast cancer, and women's health. So I believe the first up will be Dr. Greenblatt who will be presenting both her topic as well as Dr. Cantor's. Thank you, Dr. Greenblatt. Thank you, thank you, Kelsey. Um, and thank you everyone for that really wonderful introduction. And it's really my pleasure to be here. Um, the whole concept about fertility preservation is something I'm very, very passionate about. Um, Dr. Ariel Cantor could not be present tonight, um, but she and I have worked closely for years. Uh, she was a reproductive endocrine fellow uh, within our program. And um, fertility preservation and particularly uh, also including women who might have a BRCA mutation is, is something that we, we talk a lot about. So I'm very, very happy to to present uh, the part that she was going to do. Um, her, her presentation mine are actually quite related. So um, if, if it sounds a little bit similar, it's because we're uh, often talking about related um, areas. Um, so the main topic that Ariel was gonna present was fertility options for BRCA pre-vivors. And that's uh, women who haven't a pre-vivor is someone who hasn't experienced cancer but is at risk and um, as we know um, uh, younger women uh, women with BRCA uh, cancer mutations are at higher risk for cancers um, including breast and ovarian at a younger age and um, she and I both feel that knowledge is power so um I'm going to talk a little bit about what she was going to present. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so family planning and reproductive decision making is an important consideration when discussing BRCA mutations in young, healthy women. And when we say young, healthy, this is what we mean pre-vivors, women who have not experienced cancer, but they know they're at higher risk. Um, uh, Particularly for ovarian cancer, um, the guidelines are often to consider uh, preventative surgery, uh, either to remove the ovaries or the tubes first, and then the ovaries to prevent the onset of uh, ovarian cancer. And of course, those guidelines would be uh, coming from discussion with a gynecologic oncologist. And the age of that really would depend on a lot on family history and when these cancers have presented. The one thing about ovarian cancer is there aren't really effective ways to screen for it. Breast cancer, there are more effective ways, such as um, MRIs and um, you know frequent um, um, frequent imaging, uh, mam mammography, etc. So. Often we could pick up breast cancers at a very, very early stage, but ovarian cancer is what I call really sneaky and there really isn't good screening for that. Um, but because of the lack of reliable ovarian cancer screening, uh, the recommendations for what we call risk reducing salpingo ophorectomy, that's removing the fallopian tubes before they become affected um, is usually generally between the ages of 35 and 40 for women who have a BRCA1 mutation, maybe a little bit older for women who have a BRCA2 mutation. So that brings up the topic of two things. What if you haven't completed your family by that age? And the other thing 
um, is uh, can you do something about preventing the transmission of a BRCA2 future children? Um, some women, if they're if they're not quite ready to undergo an oophorectomy, it does. There is pretty good evidence now that ovarian cancer actually starts in the fallopian tubes before the um, before the ovaries. So sometimes they'll recommend removing the fallopian tubes before removing the ovaries, which renders someone uh, completely menopausal. Um, that can count for some risk reduction, but obviously natural conception won't happen if you don't have fallopian tubes. Um, and the important thing is these surgical considerations are often being discussed during very key times in the reproductive life cycle. And uh, the fertility window could, might be narrowed by the discussion of these prophylactic surgeries, which could result in infertility or sterility. Next slide, please. Um, so, and I, I also want to mention that um, I think we all know that um, people are delaying childbearing. So the issue of having preventative surgery, which we didn't really know about decades ago, but we do now, but the issue of having preventative surgery that might render someone infertile maybe wasn't such a big issue 50 years ago when most women would probably maybe complete their childbearing by the age of 30. But the average age of first pregnancy in Canada now is well over the age 30. So with delay in childbearing, that the conflict between undergoing risk-reducing surgery and not having completed or possibly even started your family is sort of on a, um, a path of crashing. Uh, fertility preservation, which can be done electively, or urgently, which is more what I'll talk about, are techniques used to preserve the reproductive ability of an individual who might be facing medical treatment that might lead to infertility. So for example, if someone might uh, lose their ovaries, then you might consider going through stimulation, essentially going through IVF without the part of the fertilization and just freezing the unfertilized eggs. If uh, the person knows who they might want to um, parent with in the future, or they know who the, the sperm might come from, then embryo freezing can be done, meaning that the eggs get fertilized and then frozen. There are other options as well. Uh, if people don't want to do this, or they've kind of missed that window of opportunity, and that could be conceiving in the future with the use of egg donation, so eggs from either an, uh, a woman going through the process to donate or frozen eggs. And of course, adoption is also a, um, an option. Next slide. Um, the process of going through egg freezing does involve um, a period of what we call controlled ovarian stimulation. Uh, this usually takes approximately 10 days to a week and a half. Um, daily injections of potent fertility drugs that force the ovary to stimulate and produce a bunch of eggs rather than the one egg that normally gets produced and ovulated each year. Um, if women actually are at risk of breast cancer or they've been diagnosed with breast cancer, often we'll add an oral medication called letrozole that does not allow the estrogen level to rise as high as it would during a traditional stimulation cycle. Um, there's another medication that gets introduced partway through to prevent uh, early ovulation. Obviously, we wouldn't want these eggs to be released before we're able to harvest them. And when the follicles grow to a size that seems compatible with retrieving uh, healthy, mature eggs, there's a final medication called the trigger medication. That causes the final maturation of the eggs. And of course, they would be released and ovulated, but we book the egg retrieval at a time we know uh, will happen before that. So generally the, that time interval is uh, 36 hours. The egg retrieval uh, is done under uh, sedation. You can see here in the picture, there's a, a vaginal ultrasound. It goes into the vagina up against uh, the top of the vagina beside the cervix. And we could visualize the follicles on ultrasound and there's a needle guide that runs along the um, ultrasound probe that 
punctures through the top of the uh, vagina and into the follicles and the eggs get literally sucked out. Um, the eggs then go get handed, the fluid gets handed off to the embryology lab. The um, embryologists go through the fluid. They find the cluster of cells where the egg is hiding. They take all the cells off. They find which eggs have been fully mature and then they freeze them. If uh, a woman who's gone through a process of fertility preservation and egg freezing in the future wants to use those eggs or is required to use those eggs because other options are no longer available, then the process of using those eggs means uh, preparing the uterus for uh, to allow an embryo to implant. The eggs are thawed, uh, fertilized with uh, partner sperm or donor sperm, and then uh, the fertilized eggs are then followed for a few days to see how they develop, and then uh, an embryo transfer is done. Next slide. Um, during the process of what we call controlled ovarian stimulation, monitoring the response to that, um, the medications, the fertility medications we use are protein, so they can't be taken orally. They do have to be injected. Because we're stimulating the ovary to make a whole cohort of follicles where the eggs are, rather than the one that would normally be released every month, um, women can experience some bloating, some bruising or discomfort at the injection sites because of the kind of magnification of the hormone changes that normally happen in the cycle. They're much higher uh, levels of hormones. It can cause some new disturbance, sometimes headaches, um, sometimes, as I said, a little bit of discomfort. There has not been shown, and I get this asked all the time, there is no proven link between fertility medications and later development of breast or ovarian cancer. Um, a complication of going through stimulation, uh, which happens much less nowadays because our protocols have been modified and we could almost totally eliminate overstimulation or what we call ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Um, but that's really where we the ovaries over respond to medication. And in the worst case scenario, it could lead to extreme bloating, lots of uh, fluid accumulation in the abdomen, et cetera. Very rarely, well under 1% of the time now with our newer um, protocols, it can lead to life-threatening complications. Um, People are always afraid about the egg retrieval, about um, you know the safety, the discomfort. Um, it can be a bit uncomfortable, but we're usually pretty good at controlling uh, severe pain with um, pretty adequate sedation and pain medication. There's always a small risk of complication from the from the procedures, such as bleeding into the ovary or the abdomen, developing an infection accidentally hitting, you know, there are other structures in the abdomen, bladder, bowel, blood vessels. But when you add all those risks together, they actually happen in far, far, far under 1% of all egg retrievals. Next slide. Um, the chance of a successful pregnancy uh, coming from eggs that have been harvested and frozen really depends on the number of mature eggs that have been able to be frozen. Um, the younger the woman is, the fewer eggs would be needed in the future because the egg quality is inversely related to the age of the woman. So it would take more eggs to lead to a healthy, chromosomally normal, competent embryo in someone who's older and fewer eggs in someone who's younger. We usually suggest that in women up to the age of 35, 36, ideally we'd like to harvest 15 to 20 eggs. Have to realize though, just as any person going through a regular IVF cycle, uh, even if this is done and um, in the future, the only way to conceive someone's own biologic children would be with the use of her own eggs, we cannot guarantee a live birth. Eggs don't always um, survive the freeze thaw. They don't always fertilize. They don't always grow. And with any IVF cycle, um, an embryo placed in the uterus is not guaranteed to implant. But it does certainly give uh, women the opportunity to preserve a fertility that might be um, 
might be damaged either by treatment or by aging or by uh, chemotherapy. Next slide. Um, the Ontario, there is uh, fairly good public funding. Ontario is only one of two provinces in the entire country that publicly funds IVF and fertility treatments. Uh, British Columbia just announced that they will be next year, but it's still very vague as to how. The Ontario Fertility Program, which is part of the Ministry of Health, but not under OHEP, it's actually separate from OHEP, uh, allows one cycle of egg freezing if uh, it's done for medical reason. In other words, someone is imminently going to be facing uh, either chemotherapy or removal of their ovaries or, or something we know will potentially affect their fertility. Um, and women have to hold a valid health card, um, live in Ontario, um, not have received funding and be, be having been diagnosed with something in which the treatment, either surgical radiation or, or uh, medical, is known to possibly affect their uh, fertility. Medications are not covered. The storage of the eggs or embryos long term is not uh, covered. And if egg freezing is done for medical reasons, um, and if that woman or that couple decides they want to create embryos, not just eggs, then the embryology part, the creation of the embryos is not covered by the program. Next slide. Um, I said some, some people might already have a committed relationship where they decide that they want to uh, freeze embryos rather than eggs. Um, the process is the same. The only difference is that rather than just harvesting the eggs, finding out which are mature and freezing them, the eggs are actually fertilized with sperm, either partner sperm or donor sperm. The fertilized eggs called zygotes are grown for a while until they become an embryo and then the embryo is frozen. Now, the one thing that um, can be considered, particularly if someone is known to have uh, a mutation, a single gene mutation like BRCA, uh, which we know is autosomal dominant, meaning half the children will carry it, half won't on average. Uh, some people or couples might decide that they actually want to pre-screen their embryos. So once they have an embryo made, that they might want to pre-screen their embryos, take a few cells out of the embryo, freeze the embryo, and send those cells to a uh, genetic reference lab who can then determine whether the cells that came out of that embryo do or do not carry the mutation. And uh, a lot of people um, consider doing this, because, especially families that have been quite devastated from breast and ovarian cancer because of BRCA mutations, often just really want to kind of get it out of their family. So that's another uh, consideration for a specific group of women. Uh, who have a BRCA mutation, or if their husband has a BRCA mutation. Um, and um, the other Dr. Ellen who's here, Dr. Ellen Warner and I, um, with um, someone very well known to her, actually did uh, several years ago, publish a paper to look at whether it actually is cost effective to do that versus all the screening that happens or, or treatment of cancer in couples that have BRCA mutations, and it actually is cost effective to prevent um, future children being born with it. Next slide. Um, what we're calling PGT or pre-implantation genetic testing, there are different kinds. When we talk about PGTM, such as looking for a BRCA mutation, PGTM is looking for a specific mutation that we know that that person or that couple are at risk of transmitting. So it could be BRCA, which is sort of what I'm talking about here. It could be cystic fibrosis. There are all sorts of genetic diseases that um, run in families that people might be aware of and might want, want to not pass on the progeny. Um, the purpose of pre-screening the embryos is to select embryos that would transmit the disease and then selectively not transfer them. Although the IVF part is covered by the Ontario uh, Fertility Program, the actual genetic testing is not covered by the Ministry of Health 
I don't want to go there. It's very short-sighted. We're trying to work on that. Um, but currently, the actual screening is not covered. Um, next slide. Um, again, just to reiterate, the use of fertility medication is, does not appear to increase the risk of breast or ovarian cancer in women with or without BRCA mutations. Next slide. Um, so in conclusion, many women, what we call them pre-vivors, people who have not been affected but might be higher risk because of strong family history or a genetic mutation, one of which is BRCA, not the only one that can increase the risk of breast cancer. They really need to balance the risk, the balance, um, you know, the need for risk reduction surgery, particularly for ovarian cancer and um, their reproductive timeline and family planning decisions. And, and it is getting harder because people are tending to have children later. It's a complex decision and negotiating all those priorities. And uh, I will refer to some um, sort of decision aids when I go into my own talk. And the reproductive counseling part of this is a really important aspect of care in young patients who do have a BRCA mutation. Um, okay, uh, please, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and then we'll answer them at the end. Uh, next slide. Those are just some references that Dr. Cantor put in. Um, I borrowed her beautiful presentation slide and changed the title because I thought he did such a good job. What I'm going to talk about is, is sort of quite similar, but it is uh, more directed at women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer. So not women who are pre-vivors and are considering um, risk-reducing surgery or screening of embryos uh, to prevent transmission of BRCA, but women uh, who are still in the reproductive age group uh, who have been diagnosed with breast cancer. And uh, we see lots of women uh, in a very urgent uh, fashion to talk about the option of fertility preservation. Next slide. So the main things uh, I wanted to cover here is the importance, how important it is to preserve fertility for AYA. AYA stands for Adolescent and Young Adult uh, Canadians. So that's usually between the ages of 18 and 39. Um, I said with ovaries diagnosed with breast cancer because not everyone identifies as female, um, but people who have ovaries are diagnosed with breast cancer. I'm gonna go through a case study because I think it will really bring it home and talk about what the options are. And the reason I'm focusing on breast cancer and Dr. Warner will talk about this a little bit more is that some of the treatments for breast cancer, particularly the chemotherapy, and then often the delay for hormonal treatment is a bit of a double whammy in, um, possibly affecting the ability to conceive when given the go-ahead. Um, and then I'll briefly review the Ontario Fertility Program specifically for fertility preservation. Next slide. Um, starting in 2006, then 2013, and the most recent updated in 2018, the American Society of Clinical Oncology strongly recommends the discussion around fertility preservation in cancer patients. And I call this an ounce of prevention. As part of education and informed consent before cancer therapy, cancer doctors, oncologists really need to address the possibility that the treatments they'll be offering that are life-saving, um, that are being offered to uh, patients in their reproductive years can affect their future fertility. And to not do so is really, I think, in this day and age, sort of malpractice. And I know it's hard to balance the urgency around developing a treatment plan for a young person recently diagnosed with cancer, um, but it's gotta be brought up. And if the oncologist feels it's beyond their scope to talk about all the details about uh, why fertility preservation should be considered. There are many ways to refer to an appropriate um, specialist 
like Dr. Cantor and myself, reproductive endocrinology uh, doctor. Next slide. Um, there have been many, many uh, studies looking at uh, survivors, survivors of cancer. And one of the biggest causes of stress uh, in people who have been treated in their younger years and are survivors is that um, the ability to bear children is such an important concept to the majority of people. Procreation is a basic human instinct. So the inability to bear a child can be devastating for many individuals, even though they realize that they've survived a life-threatening disease. Fertility preservation has been cited as one of the top five unmet needs for adolescent, and I'll add young, you know, young adult cancer patients, along with things like ongoing health concerns, balancing work, school, romantic relationships, etc. Fertility preservation, which is called FP here, raises increasingly important medical and quality of life issues for cancer survivors. And therefore, wherever possible, oncofertility care should be an inter integral part of cancer care, right from diagnosis through to survivorship. Next slide. Um, this is just really showing uh, very recent data from um, from um, Cancer uh, Canadian Cancer Association is what the projected distribution of uh, cancer diagnoses will be in 2024. And you could see that this area here, the pink, um, kind of the, I don't know if you can see my pointer about, I guess not. The upper right side, that quarter that's pink is basically breast cancer. So 25 per 20, oh, there you go. Thanks, Martin. Uh, 25 percent of all cases of cancer diagnosed um, in females will be breast cancer. Um, the treatment of breast cancer and particularly chemotherapy can negatively impact fertility in several ways, including a direct effect on uh, the ovaries. We call that the gonadotoxic effect from the chemotherapy, as well as often there will be a recommendation to delay childbearing for a period of time, um, either to get beyond the high risk time for recurrence, but also because certain many breast cancers are hormone sensitive and part of the treatment after chemotherapy is hormone therapy or endocrine therapy. And that can delay the ability to conceive by years as well. And, and aging um, is one of the biggest negative effects on fertility. On the bright side, breast cancer survival is actually quite high, particularly for early stage disease, which is why I think it's so important to focus on life after breast cancer. And a big part of life after breast cancer may be having children. Uh, next slide. The effect, uh, the effect of cancer treatment on fertility really there's no 100% algorithm where we could say, you know, this person will or will not suffer fertility effects. It, it depends on, on the age of treatment. So the younger patient tends to have better egg quality and more eggs. So you can sort of damage more eggs and still sort of get away with it. The type of chemotherapy the type of chemotherapy used, the total dose, whether there are multiple agents being used, if there's radiation to the pelvis, which is not really an issue for breast cancer because radiation of breast cancer is very local, and combined modalities, which can each, you know, one plus one plus one could equal 10. Next slide. Um, so for example, and this, we see someone like this every week. Um, following a recent diagnosis of breast cancer, Rachel, a 33-year-old woman who's had one pregnancy and one live birth, was referred by her surger a surgeon to a reproductive endocrinologist for discussion of the possible effects of cancer therapy on future reproductive function and fertility preservation. She had found a lump in her breast three months prior, was referred to a rapid breast uh, cancer screening clinic, Mammogram and ultrasound confirmed a four centimeter uh, suspicious solid lesion in the left upper quadrant. 
uh, lymph nodes under her arm didn't feel affected. They felt quite benign. And uh, she underwent an ultrasound guided needle biopsy with rapid pathology, which confirmed an invasive ductal uh, breast carcinoma grade three. There was some suspicion that there might be early uh, lymph uh, channel invasion, but it's hard to say that just on a biopsy. She was referred to both a medical oncologist who would talk about further medical treatment and a fertility fertility clinic uh, such as ours the day after her biopsy when the pathology was confirmed as being malignant. Next slide. Um, when we met this woman, and like I said, at Mount Sinai Fertility, we have an urgent oncofertility program. Um, we have a dedicated nurse practitioner, Nicola Fernell, Nicola Fernell, who is dedicated to fit people in within very few days to go through all the options. At the time of fertility consultation, um, the medical oncologist still had not been seen because we get people in very quickly. So it really wasn't known what the immediate plan was, whether they were gonna talk about removal of the tumor or gonna talk about chemotherapy, first to shrink the tumor. There was no strong family history of breast, ovarian, or prostate cancer to really, really twig the concept that this might be a BRCA mutation related cancer, but the fact that she was so young, she would be screened for a BRCA mutation anyhow. In the consult, we talk about things that might affect her future reproductive potential. One is the toxic effect of the alkylating-based chemotherapy, and pretty well every breast cancer regimen will have something called cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide is quite a toxic agent, which tends to kill off uh, eggs that are developing and even those that are in the resting phase. Because the pathology is still preliminary, the final surgery hadn't occurred, we didn't know if the tumor had uh, estrogen receptor status, which could affect future treatments such as uh, hormone modulating therapies. Um, we would not discuss how quickly someone could try to conceive after um, treatment for breast cancer because, and I know Dr. Warner will talk about that because that really is an oncologist decision, not a fertility doctor decision. And we talk about the option of undergoing uh, what we discussed in the first talk, urgent controlled ovarian stimulation, egg harvest, and either egg freezing or embryo freezing so that those that material is frozen before uh, the person is exposed to chemotherapy that might um, affect their ovarian function. If this material does need to be used in the future, uh, either to start a family or in this case to enlarge her family, then as stated, we'd be talking about egg thawing and fertilization in the lab. We also do mention other ancillary methods. We don't consider uh, things like, um, there are medications called GnRH agonists that suppress the entire reproductive axis for a number of months. And uh, there is some evidence, it's not black and white, but there is some evidence that it might protect the uh, pool of resting eggs within the ovary from the damaging effects of chemotherapy. Uh, it's not black and white yet, um, but it's relatively benign. And I would never consider that as, uh, as effective as freezing eggs, but it could be an ancillary treatment. Next slide. Uh, in this case, Rachel was otherwise well. She had regular periods. Uh, she happened to be on day 16 of a very regular 28 day cycle. And as we said at the time that we saw her to talk about fertility preservation options, we didn't know what her uh, hormone status or her HERS2 receptor status, which is a protein that can modify the um, either the course of the tumor and offer different treatment options. And we didn't know if she uh, had a mutation that predisposed to breast cancer. So we didn't know that yet. Next slide. So in general, at the consult, we talk about the possible effect of the chemotherapy on ovarian reserve and everyone responds differently. So we can't predict for someone. We do look at their current ovarian reserve with blood work and ultrasound. If it looks like they have a lot of eggs, 
it's somewhat more reassuring that even though we know that chemo will damage some, we hope that there will be enough in the future to conceive. But not everyone reacts the same way to chemotherapy. We said there might be uh, a need for future hormonal therapy that could delay the ability to try. We also say that, you know, if, if she chooses to go through a stimulation neck freezing, she might never need the material, right? It might not have been something she needs, but um, a lot of women find comfort in knowing it's there in case. We also explained that uh, the use of frozen uh, biologic material cannot absolutely guarantee a future pregnancy. And then we discuss about what's needed should those frozen eggs be used in the future, which is basically completing the process of IVF. Next slide. We also, as uh, Dr. Ari uh, Cantor mentioned, we talk about other options such as adoption in the future, egg donation in the future. Next slide. This is just the picture of the ovary. And um, what we're looking at when we look at the ovary is the resting follicles, which could be in the ovary for decades, but could still be damaged by uh, chemotherapy are these tiny little, what we call primordial follicles. But we usually see uh, uh, follicles with eggs that are developing to ovulation. And these are the ones that are even more sensitive to the effects of chemotherapy. Next slide. I'm going to skip this one. Next slide. Um, it just sort of demonstrates that um, this is trying to demonstrate that a woman is born with all the eggs that she will ever have. And in fact, the peak of the number of, egg, of eggs in the ovary are in the ovary before birth. And over time, this number just naturally decreases, decreases, decreases until there are not enough eggs to generate um, a cycle and even to generate a healthy pregnancy. Um, the average age of menopause is 51. The end of fertility is usually felt to be somewhere around the age of 44. So before actual menopause, of course, that's variable. The natural age of menopause uh, could be 45 to 55. But what happens with things like chemo radiation, let's say um, this purple line is it'll kind of advance by uh, decreasing the resting pool of follicles, it will advance the age of menopause. And so the window of opportunity might be shortened. And with uh, the delay in childbearing that's happening in, in the century, that can overlap. Next slide. So I'm just showing you a picture on ultrasound. On the left is a, an ovary with lots and lots and lots of follicles. We call these natural follicles a lot. The blood test that gives us an idea of how many follicles is AMH, and this is a very good AMH. On the right is a similar picture of an ovary that's almost totally depleted of eggs. You could see it's, it's much smaller. You don't see all these black circles, and the AMH level is very, very low. This happens normally over time, but certainly it could be advanced with things like chemotherapy. Next slide. And unfortunately, natural fertility declines with age. So uh, the green uh, bar shows just the chance of uh, having children when people start trying in their 20s versus the chance of uh, conception uh, with increasing aging. And it's not just this is without chemo, without cancer or anything. This is natural fertility. The other thing that happens with increasing age is the risk of miscarriage goes up because the eggs that are being ovulated later in life uh, also have more damage and have more errors that does not allow a live birth. Next slide. Um, with fertility preservation, just showing you pictures, uh, we could freeze eggs in the middle. That's a, a single egg. We could freeze embryos. Uh, you could see the eight cell embryo up to the top and the left. And occasionally, which I don't want to go into a lot of detail because it's, um, it's not something we need to consider that often for breast cancer, is uh, freezing ovarian tissue. And we might do that for someone who is too young to go through uh, IVF or does not have enough time to do that. Next slide. 
So generally, when there's a diagnosis of cancer, right away, we want that uh, oncology team to start thinking about um, future fertility. Um, often we get a referral to discuss options at that point, sometimes just a little bit later when the pathology is more known and the treatment plan is more determined, uh, because then whatever treatment is planned, uh, we might have a better idea whether there's a, a high risk, no risk, or in between risk of fertility preservation. And then the patient really needs to be informed of the risk. And then we could talk about options to uh, preserve fertility, if that's something both that they want or something that uh, is an option for them. Next slide. Sorry. Um, yeah. And this, again, is just a pictorial uh, of um, for IVF generally. So we stimulate multiple eggs. We harvest through transvaginal ultrasound um, needle aspiration. What I've put in X through is what happens with normal IVF. So we, we have an egg. It's a fertilized egg called a zygote. It divides, it divides, it divides, it makes an embryo, and then we do an embryo transfer. The only thing that differs with fertility preservation and egg freezing is that the egg harvest is uh, displaced from the embryology. So um, if you freeze eggs, then all the rest of the fertilization and the embryo transfer could happen several years down the road. Next slide. Um, I think I'm going to skip this because it's, it's talking about ovarian tissue transplantation. Um, this is really just showing that uh, the traditional way that we do IVF, where we start with the early uh, part of the cycle, but now we have many, many options to do what we call a random start, meaning it really we could start a stimulation even if someone is anywhere in their menstrual cycle. So people used to be con very concerned about, oh, well, you know, I won't be able to start this for three weeks and then I won't finish for three weeks and then I'm delaying my chemotherapy by six weeks. That is no longer a consideration. We could get the whole process done easily within two, two and a half weeks. And the other thing is there's been lots of data to show that that very short delay does not affect the long-term um, prognosis for that one. Next slide. Um, next slide. This is just showing that we could really start on almost any phase of the menstrual cycle from their early start to the just after ovulation to just before the expected period. We could manipulate the cycle to allow us to not have a long delay. Next slide. Um, the difference between um, fresh eggs and frozen eggs is not very different. Um, the the only difference between IVF with fresh eggs versus frozen eggs is that with egg freezing and thawing, you might lose about 10 to 15% of the eggs, where when you're fertilizing eggs that are fresh, you're not losing anything in the freeze thaw. But other than that, an egg has the same potential to lead to a fertilized embryo and a live birth as any other age-related egg. So it really depends on the um, age of the woman producing the egg. Next slide. And IVF success rates really are age-related as is natural pregnancy. And the use of frozen eggs in relating to a future uh, pregnancy, if those eggs need to be used in IVF, really depends on the age of the, the woman is when the eggs are harvested. So, um, the younger you are, the better your chances are. Next slide. Um, this is just providing the link to the Ontario uh, the Ontario Fertility Program. It was launched December 21st, 2015. It does cover IVF for fertility need, but it also covers fertility, urgent fertility preservation for people facing a risk of infertility due to treatment. Next slide. Um, I think we talked about this in Dr. Cantor's slide. Uh, one cycle covered for medical need. Next slide. 
Um, and that medical need could be chemotherapy. It could be the need to remove the tubes or ovaries uh, because of uh, um, risk of ovarian cancer down the road. Next slide. Uh, in our program, we see patients who are referred within 24 to 72 hours. As I said, we have a, a very well-trained uh, nurse practitioner backed up by REI staff. Um, there are more options if eggs are frozen because it doesn't mean that you know for sure who the sperm donor will be. And also it leaves more options down the road if the person going through this is found to have a BRCA mutation. There's no delays now with our random start uh, protocol and the Ontario program covers one cycle other than the medication and the storage fees. Next slide. Um, just to give you some uh, resources, there is uh, a good decision age because this is an overwhelming decision for some people. So there is a decision aid through Rethink Breast Cancer. It's on their website. It's called BEFORE. BEFORE stands for Begin Exploring Fertility Options, Risks, and Expectations. And it's a decision aid to help young breast cancer patients in Canada, help them decide you know, what's important to them. Um, it, it, it just helps them balance all the competing uh, needs. So I think it's quite a good, um, uh, quite a good app. Next slide. Uh, this is just so that when uh, people are uh, referred, we do have um, an area where we say, please indicate if this is an urgent referral, like someone that needs to be referred right away. Next slide. Urgent oncology, we say here fertility preservation, urgent medical needs. So, you know, we're going to bring that person in right away. Next slide. Um, as much information we could get on the consult is really helpful, like what the treatment might be if it's known. It might not be known by the time we see the patient, but, but that's okay too. Next slide. I think the take home message here is cancer survivorship rates are high. Cancer and its treatment can lead to infertility. Fertility is an important aspect of quality of life for many people um, after cancer treatment and survivorship. And there are many resources for patients that exist and they should be utilized. And I think I show some of those on the next page. Yeah, so the PINK program, which Dr. Warner really is the... Um, is the driver behind Fertile Future. It's a program that helps fund um, uh, fertility preservation, the Ministry of Health uh, program, Rethink Breast Cancer, which is also very good support. And um, for women who do have uh, BRCA mutations, there is a Facebook group called the BRCA Sisterhood of Canada. It's a closed group. And by that, I mean, um, you have to be allowed to join. They don't want just everyone to join, but I think it's a great resource uh, for women to share their experience, share information, and um, yeah, just to make you aware of that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Greenblatt. Uh, that was a very in-depth presentation for yours and Dr. Cantor's material, and now we are really looking forward to hearing about um, the cancer side of decision making for people affected by breast cancer planning a family. Great. Um, I am so delighted to be invited to speak to you guys today. Can everybody hear me? Um, in the interest of time, I'll skip going into raptures about why I adore L'Chaim. And also, I will skip telling you why I, unfortunately, along with many of my Jewish colleagues, feel the need to divest from the University of Toronto until they get their act together. So I'm going to tell you about the four questions, a Jewish title, that I get asked most often as a medical oncologist about pregnancy after breast cancer. So like Dr. Greenblatt, I chose to focus on breast cancer, even though the fertility preservation methods that she told you about are really, are really applicable to any female cancer patient who's going to have her fertility challenged by her treatment. But breast cancer has some special unique issues that are relevant to fertility preservation and to pregnancy. 
Okay, so why breast cancer? It's the commonest cancer in women of reproductive age. And also the risk of ovarian damage with breast cancer is particularly high because most young women are gonna need chemotherapy either before or after their breast surgery in, in order to get rid of any cancer cells that might have strayed away from the breast cancer and set up shops somewhere else in the body. And if we don't eradicate those cancers right early on, those cells right early on, those will form metastases and eventually cause cancer recurrence and death. The other problem is that the regimens that we use for the chemotherapy of breast cancer usually include a drug called cyclophosphamide, an alkylating agent, which is particularly toxic to the ovaries. Another issue with breast cancer is that 80% of breast cancers are hormone sensitive because they have these little proteins on the surface called estrogen receptors. So let me explain how this works. Why is this not? Ah, there we go. Okay, so um, cancers are made of millions of tiny little cells. If we take one of those little cells of an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, blow it up and slice through it, we get something like this. So on the surface of the cell, we have these inactive proteins called estrogen receptors. They're just kind of sitting there waiting for a shidduch from the female hormone estrogen that all women have floating around in their bodies. And if one of those estrogen molecules happens to meet with an inactive estrogen receptor, boom, it gets activated. And this complex eventually gets into the nucleus of the cell and stimulates that breast cancer cell to grow and divide. Exactly the opposite of what we want, right? What we really want is for this cell to, do, to die a slow and painful death. And the way we do that is by either getting rid of estrogen by blocking the estrogen receptor, or often doing a combination of both. The problem is that process takes time. So we have to put these women on anti-estrogen therapy for five to 10 years. And so you can imagine that a 38 year old, a woman in let's say in her mid thirties, who was diagnosed with breast cancer, by the time she gets her chemo or not, and waits all this time for the hormone therapy, the chance that she's going to be naturally fertile is very low. So that's why fertility preservation is so important here. Um, the hormone therapy isn't actually toxic to the ovaries the way chemotherapy is, but you've just got this long time interval that's the problem with the ovaries aging naturally. The other problem with these ER positive cancers is because they are sensitive to hormones and are stimulated by female hormones, we get into situations where we worry that if the amount of estrogen is increased, either naturally or artificially, that might be dangerous for the woman. And those situations occur in pregnancy and when we do ovarian stimulation. So I'm also gonna give you a case. Faye is a 38 year old woman, recently married, and she and her husband were just about to start um, making a family when Faye was diagnosed with a large ER positive breast cancer that had already spread to the lymph nodes under her arm. She was referred to a medical oncologist who told her that she needed chemotherapy, then breast surgery, and eventually hormone therapy for seven 10 year, to 10 years. And when Faye said, um, can I first have some uh, fertility preservation? The medical oncologist said, absolutely not. You have a very aggressive breast cancer. You need to start chemotherapy immediately. And you shouldn't be worrying right now about pregnancy. You should be worrying about surviving. Fortunately, Faye went to her family doctor and asked for a second opinion, and she was referred to me. So Faye had four questions for me. She put them in her iPad. They were very carefully thought out and they were excellent. And that's what I'm gonna focus my talk on. First question, is pregnancy going to increase my risk of breast cancer recurrence? Because if it is, I'm not gonna preserve fertility. I just don't wanna get pregnant. So what's, what are we worried about? Well, the amount of estrogen that a woman experiences over the nine months of her pregnancy is approximately 50 times, that's like five zero times what a non-pregnant woman has. So if that woman has some breast cancer cells that are hormone sensitive in her body, what do you think that pregnancy is gonna do? Well, most people didn't wanna wait and find out. And for a very, very long time, all women were counseled that after breast cancer, they should never, ever, ever dare to become pregnant because they will surely die. Well, there were always some women who said, mm, I'm gonna take my chances. 
and they got pregnant anyways. There were also some women who accidentally got pregnant and decided to go through with the pregnancy anyways. And over time, doctors started to publish the results of these women. And what they found is instead of you know, seeing dire things like these women rapidly having their breast cancer recur and you know, death, they found that the women actually did better than they expected and seemed to be more likely to survive. Well, the skeptics said, ah, you know, these, these results are all biased, these studies are all flawed. So generally when we have this problem in medicine, we do something called a randomized controlled trial to try to definitively say whether something is safe or something works. But you can't do that here. You can't take a thousand women who've had breast cancer and say, okay, you 500, you have to get pregnant. You other 500, you can't get pregnant. And then look at what happens in another few years. So the best thing we can do here to do these studies is to find a large number of women who have pregnancy after breast cancer and match them very carefully based on their personal and tumor characteristics to women who decided to not get pregnant and compare their outcomes. You also have to follow them long enough because ER positive breast cancer in particular can recur many years after diagnosis. So in a recent analysis, they actually found in the literature 1,300 women who had had pregnancy after breast cancer whose characteristics were well described, and they were able to, man it to match each one of these patients to two women who did not get pregnant after breast cancer. And here's what they found. No difference. Their chance of having a recurrence was absolutely the same whether they got pregnant or not. Fabulous news for women with breast cancer. So what's phase second question? Is freezing my embryos going to increase my risk of cancer recurrence? And here there are two concerns. First concern is, well, you can't start chemotherapy until you've finished that ovarian stimulation and egg retrieval, and that's gonna delay starting chemotherapy. During that time, is the cancer gonna grow very quickly? Is it, going to start, is it going to metastasize somewhere else in the body if it hasn't done so yet? Well, that was probably a, a more significant concern maybe 10, 15 years ago, when it could take up to two months, actually, to complete um, this whole cycle of, of fertility preservation. But as you heard from Dr. Greenblatt, they can now do it in less than two weeks. That's insignificant. We, we believe these cancers have been in the body for a year or two or more. So what's a couple of weeks delay? In very, very few cases, is that a significant problem? Second concern is that when we do ovarian stimulation over that two week period, women are getting moderately high levels of estrogen in their body, higher than they would normally have. Is that gonna be stimulating this cancer in their body? So again, studies were done. And it looks like in all these studies, if you match women who did and did not have ovarian stimulation, their outcomes in terms of breast cancer recurrence with five years of, with eight years of follow-up on average, which isn't, Everybody has relapsed, but it's a majority of relapses. There is no difference. There is no negative effect of ovarian stimulation on cancer recurrence. Again, fantastic news for women. Question number three, do I have to wait seven to 10 years to complete my hormonal therapy and only then have a baby? I'll be like in my mid to late forties. My friends are all going to have their kids in college by then. So, is it possible to interrupt my hormonal therapy without increasing my risk of cancer? And until very recently, nobody would have known the answer to that, but there is an extremely important study that's going to definitively answer that question. And this study is the POSITIVE trial. The POSITIVE trial is a study that has been done in 17 different countries, including Canada, with a big contribution relatively from Sunnybrook, of over 500 women aged 42 or younger, um, who had non-metastatic ER-positive breast cancer and had been on hormone therapy for only a year and a half to two and a half years. Those women were then eligible for the study and enrolled and stopped their hormone therapy at the time of enrollment. They then waited three months, so for the hormones to wash out of their body, and then they were told to go ahead and get pregnant, either naturally or with help from people like Dr. Greenblatt. It was estimated that this process would take about two years till delivery, give the women some time to breastfeed if they want to, and you can breastfeed from your healthy breast, even if you've had another breast removed or radiated. And then the women would resume their hormonal therapy for the amount of time that the oncologist thought was necessary. 
Now we now have enough follow-up on the women in the study that we have some preliminary results. Well, it's a, not a randomized study, so who are we going to compare these women to? Well, fortunately, there was another fairly recent study of vera-positive young women who did not interrupt their hormone therapy. So they were used as a control group. And here are the results. So the women in the positive study are the solid red line on the bottom. The control group are the dotted dark line on the top. And you can see that at 36 months, that's three years of average follow-up, the recurrence rate in the women in the positive study is only 4.5% and lower than the 5.8% in the other group. Are these differences real? Well, maybe, you know, does pregnancy actually protect you from recurrence? Who knows, but it certainly appears to be very safe, at least with our short-term data. Obviously, we need longer-term follow-up to be sure. But this has been a really landmark study published in the New England Journal and got a lot of publicity and is giving a lot of women reassurance that it's okay for them to stop their hormone therapy and get pregnant at a normal age. Last question. How long should I wait before trying to become pregnant? And what Faye is really asking here is the report in time when my risk of recurrence isn't so high and I can be reasonably sure that I will live long enough to raise this baby to adulthood. Unfortunately for ER positive cancers, there isn't a good answer to that. And that's because 50% of recurrences occur after five years. And most women don't wanna wait five years or more to get pregnant. For the ER negative cancers, things are a lot simpler because the highest risk of recurrence is in the first three years. And many women wait out that three years knowing that at that point in time, the risk of recurrence is relatively low. So what I tell all these women is, you know what, you need a plan B. Hopefully your cancer will never come back, but we can never promise you that it won't. So you need to speak to your partner, your friends, your relatives, and see you know, what combination of those people would be willing to look after your kid if God forbid something happened to you. And most people are able to come up with that. So what did Faye do? Faye decided to go to Dr. Greenblatt's or one of her, I um, can't remember who she went to, but she went to someone for fertility preservation and she froze four embryos at her age of 38, it's hard to get those 15 to 20 eggs and, and you know high number of embryos that you want, but four was pretty good. And then just to give her another um, insurance policy, she had ovarian suppression with a GnRH agonist during her chemotherapy. She then had her, so she had her chemo, then she had her surgery and was start, started on her hormone therapy. And two years after that point, she stopped her hormone therapy and decided she wanted to get pregnant. So I told her to wait three months for the washout. And at the end of that time, I did some scans to make sure that there wasn't any obvious, instant, obvious sign of spread of her cancer. Because unfortunately, occasionally I've seen that. The woman feels great, but when you do a scan, there are metastases in the lungs or bones or somewhere. So I think that's a really important step, especially for relatively high-risk women like Faye. But she was clear. A year later, she gave birth to a healthy baby girl, Sarah, using one of her frozen embryos. She then breastfed for six months and went back on her hormonal therapy. And this September, Faye will be stopping her hormonal therapy because it will be complete. And Sarah will be starting grade one. And I have to tell you that cases like Faye's are like one of the most important reasons that I continue to do this kind of challenging job because I get like incredible nachas from these cases. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Warner, and to Dr. Greenblatt for those really excellent talks on this topic. I am mindful that we were, maybe should be wrapping it up, um, but if there are any uh, buddy who has a question that they want to put in the chat. Um, oh, so there is one. Um, this question says, are there any contraindications to going through ovarian stimulation or egg retrieval for someone with any form of ovarian cancer, especially if ER positive? Um, I, I'll, I'll give you my two cents. Um, when we do ovarian stimulation in women who we think might have a hormone sensitive tumor, either they know they're estrogen receptor positive or they don't know their hormone status yet. We actually always add in an oral medication, letrozole, which does not allow the estrogen levels to get as high as they ordinarily would. So it sort of divorces 
the egg development from the estrogen. And to be honest, that may or may not make a difference. It theoretically makes sense to try to keep estrogen levels low during stimulation. But I will say, I don't think there's any evidence that that short period of stimulation would make a difference for the long-term outcome of that disease. So that's my input. Um, Ellen Warner, I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, um, I'm not an expert on the literature on ovarian cancer, but um, I would have to agree with you, Ellen. At least in theory, it doesn't sound like overall that's going to make a lot of difference. Um, ovarian cancer is a little bit hormone sensitive, but not terribly so. And uh, that's why it's not a huge feature of the treatment of the disease. And I guess the maybe, other, maybe the, the ovarian stimulation, ahead. like making the ovaries grow, like are there other hormones in your cocktail that might stimulate the ovaries other than estrogen? I guess maybe that's part of the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I don't think that, um, I mean, the only issue with stimulation with an ovarian cancer is, you know, we certainly would only want to do it pretty close to when that tumor is going to be removed because there's always a risk of spilling cancer cells by, you know, putting a needle in an ovary. Um, but, you know, we we certainly get referrals from the gynecologist oncologist for women who have a highly suspicious ovarian cancer and we do you know we we sort of retrieve the ovary outside that cancer like the normal ovarian tissue and i agree i don't think there's any really strong evidence about the hormone sensitivity of ovarian cancers i'm not an oncology specialist but when we talk about hormone sensitive cancers we're usually talking about breast cancers or the, the general gynecologist was just going to weigh in and say yeah you, you would be concerned about the you, you, you know, the retrieval and having to insert the needle into something and have tumor spillage. And then of course, a lot of people going through treatment for ovarian cancer end up with a hysterectomy. And so they, you would need a gestational carrier for whatever embryo. Okay, so um, given the time constraints, uh, I really wanna thank both of the speakers. Uh, for their inc very incredible high level. I felt like I was in a residency all over again, mm -hmm. uh, the talks. And uh, I really just want to well, uh, call back um, or call on Sheila Newberger to close the session for us. Hi, everyone. I'm Sheila Newberger, and I'm the um, president of the board for National Council. And on behalf of the council, I would like to thank our fabulous physicians for sharing their expertise and their time on this very tonight to talk about this very important topic. Not only uh, did their knowledge is so obvious, but their compassion shone through throughout their presentation. And uh, we are really grateful that you were able to do this for us. Uh, this is actually part one of a two part series. The second part is on uh, June the 26th and we'll focus on surrogacy adoption and mental wellness while going through all of these processes. So I hope that some people can come then. And um, finally, I would like to thank TRIO who are our sponsors for tonight. So thank you everyone for coming, bye-bye. And sorry, everybody, I realized that somehow my camera shut off during that. So that was not intentional. Sorry about that. It's been on for about 12 hours today, so I think it wanted a rest. Thanks, everybody. It was amazing.